um, set the agenda out. Everyone should have that agenda. I'll kind of kind of go through the normal process that we go through. We have the agenda. We'll review that and, and jump into it. And um, as always, kind of have a, a staff next two meetings, but really looking forward to the conversation and just really appreciate the engagement and um, the thought process uh, from everyone in this group. So uh, really an inclusive conversation is what we're looking for here. So um, with that agenda, um, looking at uh, the next two hours, we'll go ahead and do intros again. We have EJ Davis with, with uh, OSU here today. Um, is going to give us a presentation on some work. So um, we'll go around and do introductions. Um, every time we have someone new, I like to do that just so we all know who everyone is in the room. And then we're going to jump into, I'll kind of give an overview of, of where we've been and where we're going, and then capacity and readiness. And, and EJ is going to give us uh, um, some uh, results from uh, a survey that we put out to the regional folks. So we'll talk about that, and then a little bit about the financing opportunities, um, just kind of a broad overview, and then jump into prioritization, really uh, the meat of the conversation for an hour today, and, and expect a, a good conversation there. And then we'll wrap it up uh, at 4 o'clock. And as always, I'll facilitate the overall meeting and try to keep us on track the best we can, but just really encourage that uh, conversation with the group. And then um, you can always uh, reach out um, afterwards if we can't get to something or if you have questions, comments, et cetera. So um, that's what we're looking at for the agenda, just to kind of prime the pump. Uh, any questions on that before we jump into it? All right. Um, so I'll go ahead and call out uh, – um, Kind of introductions here as I see it, and uh, just a real quick introduction, who you are, um, who you represent, um, and we'll kind of go from there. Uh, John, I have you, uh, have you first. Sure. John O'Keefe, a rancher from the desert and the forest, and also Rangeland Fire Association. All right. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Uh, Derek? Derek Gasparini, Public Affairs, here at Oregon Department of Forestry. Thank you, Derek. And EJ, looks like I have you up next. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm EJ or Emily Jane Davis. I'm an associate professor in the College of Forestry, at Oregon State University, and I'm interim director of the Extension Fire Program. Excellent. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Uh, Katie? Hi, everyone. Katie Wolstein, Rangeland Fire Specialist with the Extension Fire Program at Oregon State University, and I'm located at the Eastern Oregon Agricultural Research Center in Burns. All right. Thanks, Katie. Good to see you. Kyle. Afternoon, everybody. Kyle Williams, uh, Director of Forest Protection at the Oregon Forest Industries Council. All right. Thanks, Kyle. And Pete. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Pete Calagiri, Forest Strategy Director for the Nature Conservancy in Oregon. And I work out of Bend. All right. Hi, Pete. And uh, Mike, have you next? Mike Barsodi, if you can, oh, might be on mute there. Let me uh, unmute myself. Sorry. <laughs> Mike Barsodi, family forest landowner representing Oregon Small Woodlands Association. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Marco. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Marco Bay, executive director of Lomakatsi Restoration Project based down in southwestern Oregon, Jackson County. Marco, uh, Jim, we have you next. Yeah, Jim McCauley, Legislative Director, League of Oregon Cities. All right, thank you. Joseph? Hi there, Joseph Fail. I'm with the conservation group Klamath Siskiyou Wildland Center. We're based in Southwest Oregon. All right, thanks, Joseph. Uh, Dan? Uh, hello, Dan Seaman, uh, Senior Climate Advisor from American Forests and working with Nathan and others at ODF and elsewhere to uh, support this effort. All right. Thanks, Dan. And uh, Oriana, I know you just uh, took a bite there. Um, if you want to do a quick introduction. Sorry hey, about that. I'm Oriana Manier. I'm the Energy, Climate and Transportation Manager at Verde, and I also sit on the Global Warming Commission. All right. Thank you. Um, I see that as uh, the virtual world. We'll see if others hop on. I'll go ahead and uh, go around the room. Um, so, Amanda, if you want to do a quick intro. 
Yes. <clears throat> Amanda Sullivan Astor, I'm Forest Policy Manager with Associated Oregon Loggers, located right here in Salem, Oregon. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ryan? Good afternoon, everybody. Ryan Gordon, Planning Branch Director with the Department of Forestry. All right. Thank you. And Megan? Hi, everyone. Megan Frizzell with the Oregon Department of Forestry and the Planning Branch. Excellent. And to kind of round us off, uh, Nathan Beckman, Strategic Planning Coordinator um, with the Department of Forestry. Um, glad to be here. I'll just let you know a few others. Uh, Susan Jane Brown mentioned that she couldn't be here today, and Carl Morganson as well. And Dylan said he's going to be a little late. So um, just thank you to those folks who emailed me and let me know they wouldn't be here. And thank you to you all for, for being here. So um, we'll go ahead and jump into it, um, kind of looking at the next steps. Um, I want to provide some updates for everyone, just so everyone's aware. And then, of course, opportunities for you all to provide updates or any questions, just general ones. So I'll go ahead and jump into that. A um, couple things. Uh, Washington DNR meeting, just a reminder, we have that one scheduled for January 23rd. Uh, that email went out. I'll try to remember to send you a reminder email on that to follow up. Um, we're looking at that at the U.S. Forest Service uh, Regional Office in Portland. Um, we were able to get a room there. Um, we scheduled, I believe, two hours. And kind of the intent of that meeting um, is to hear from Washington DNR about their process they went through with their 20-year forest health strategy, uh, what worked, what didn't, uh, what they wish they had done differently, what changes they would make, um, knowing what uh, now they've been implementing and monitoring, adapting over the last five years, et cetera. So it should be a really good conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Hopefully you all can join that. And... Um, afterwards to uh, maybe loosen up the ties and, and go um, have a little happy hour and continue the conversation for those who are interested in enjoying that conversation. So I just wanted to throw that one out there. Um, are we wearing ties? Probably, I'm not wearing a tie, right. but uh, always good to just throw that out there. But uh, um, should be a really good conversation. So if you all can make it and um, also talking with them, we'll probably do a, a virtual option, um, a hybrid option for those who can't come, but I strongly encourage you to come if you can. And we're probably not gonna record it. Uh, we kinda wanna keep that, just an open, honest conversation and, and really um, have that. So once again, if, if you can come in person, I think that would be best, but also understand the, the challenges that we all face with the current environment. So um, just wanted to throw that one out there. Um, I'm gonna keep going and stop me at any point if you have questions. Um, the other one was SageCon. I uh, wanted to kind of update on SageCon. Uh, we've been getting a lot of feedback from folks about kind of the all-land strategy and um, looking at kind of the range component and, and having conversations with SageCon um, and, and really looking at how to best incorporate that range in the 20-year strategy. I know we have a few folks here working in that space, but we kind of want to increase um, kind of that look at it. And as we have been talking about is looking at some of the modeling that's been happening with SageCon and starting to integrate that. Uh, but also having conversations with them of how we can uh, create alignment between um, that group and, and the state-level efforts, uh, the shared stewardship governance, et cetera. So a lot more conversations. I don't have everything figured out. I just want to let you know that really taking that feedback and integrating with that group to look at that um, range component that I think we identified as very strong forest component in this group and how to bring that in. So, hey, Nathan, yes. is there, um, uh, Amanda, for the record, here in the, uh, um, in the office, um, is there anybody on, like, not the, what is it, the, the leadership group? I can't remember the acronym. Yep. For the governance structure. The so, agency coordination group. Yeah, the, the, the one right underneath that. What's yep. that one called? H yeah, the H agency H coordination implementation yeah. group. Yep. Yeah, so the ASIG. Yep. Um, do you have anybody from, like, ODA on that to kind no. of incorporate some of the range ag stuff? Did you all hear that? Okay, excellent. So we have, um, so just a reminder of the, the agency coordination group and the strategic leadership group really designed off kind of uh, the shared stewardship MOU, right? Looking at those, those agencies within the shared stewardship MOU, but then also having um, the BLM in those conversations as well. And then mm -hmm. conversations of how do we integrate the BLM into that shared stewardship MOU moving into the future as well. So mm -hmm. right now, um, looking at uh, the BLM, um, within the range component is kind of where we have with that agency group. Okay. So, and then of course, linking with our, our stakeholder groups, with our tribes, et cetera, is really, really the help there. So. Okay. Okay. Just, yeah, I just kind of wanted to know who the lead was from the agency perspective on range. So, cause obviously stage con kind of from the stakeholder side, but. Yep. 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 Any other questions on that? 
I appreciate that. All right, I'm going to just jump into a few communications uh, pieces as well. Um, we had talked last time just kind of what was coming up, but I just want to let everyone know about a presentation that was given to the Board of Forestry on January 4th, so that was last week. Um, and really the intent there was to inform the Board of the background, uh, kind of what it is, where we're going, et cetera. So um, just to let you know on that one, that was obviously public and recorded. I'm working on getting that recording and chopping it and posting it on the web page and send it out to folks. And once again, I uh, can send it out to, to who you want, um, kind of a public uh, video there. But want to let everyone know about that and trying to get that recording for that. And really, um, within that, there was some discussion about um, the 20-year strategy and the uh, FPFO revision and the work that's happening there and how they integrate together. And um, from, from my take on that, some good feedback from the board members that uh, the 20-year strategy that we've put together so far um, is really, really good work and a model of, of how we should be looking in the future. So um, hopefully you all had an opportunity to, to be there or watch that. If not, we'll send that around. But um, just wanted to update people on, on that, and I thought it was a really good conversation. And, and really uh, the hard work that we've all been putting into this, I think, is really important to, to express there. Um, to jump and if there's questions we'll go back. I also want to just let people know that uh, presenting to the Oregon Water Enhancement Board on the 25th, um, so OWEB to talk to their board, pretty much the same presentation, but uh, kind of tailored to that audience. Um, but just kind of keeping that group uh, in progress. And then the last one I wanted to hit on was the web page. I've been letting you know about this web page, but as people are asking questions, trying to keep that up to date, um, recordings. Um, notes, et cetera, um, from work that we've been doing. So um, just wanted to remind people of that web page and trying to keep that up to date and if people are asking questions. And then, of course, if anyone has questions, they can always uh, call or email myself. I'm happy to talk with whomever. So just wanted to throw that out within the communications aspect. That's all I got. Um, hopefully you see value in that. But if you got any other questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, I'd also open it up if anybody else has updates they want to try to provide or provide to the group. Um, now's a good opportunity. All right, excellent. I'm hearing none. We'll keep moving on. Um, so we're going to go ahead and I'll, I'll kind of walk us through and set the stage for uh, the next portion of this meeting, and we'll go from there. So we're going to pop up a quick PowerPoint and jump into it. All right, so um, just kind of setting the stage here for us, um, looking at um, the timeline um, we presented from the beginning here, so kind of the phases that we're looking at, so phase one, phase two, um, kind of building that foundation, moving into compiling the information, and then phase three, phase three is what we're moving into, which is drafting of the plan. Um, so starting, we've been having a lot of these conversations, putting um, things together, and we want to start integrating that and looking at um, how we're going to go ahead and draft this plan, um, moving into uh, June and then uh, the implementation. Um, a lot of conversations at the beginning about how we want to not just make this another shelf document, how we want to go ahead and, and implement this plan. So a lot of um, kind of thought and how we're moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to generally look at what is the drafting of the plan um, and what is our overall timeline here. The next one, we've, we've showed this a lot too, which was the work streams, um, how we've been looking at ripping this apart the different components of it, um, and then how we'll start putting this together to weave, weave it together. And remind you, kind of in the, in the past, we've been looking at where these red boxes are, really looking at the capacity and readiness assessments, the prioritization needs, um, compiling information. And then moving forward, how are we looking at putting this together? And really, it's the priority restoration actions and geographies and, and the capacity and readiness needs, uh, identifying the goals, the financial implementation plan, and that metrics and accountability, and that's where we're really moving into is starting to identify these and, and drafting of this, this plan um, overall. So I wanted to just kind of recap on, on what this is, kind of what are the work streams and how we've been looking at this process uh, to get us to this point and then moving into the future. 
Um, so I want to dig into just uh, timelines so we understand where we are with, with those timelines um, and kind of what we can expect next. So um, we presented this last time and looking at uh, what are these key timelines January through June and uh, starting to dig a little bit deeper into this. So looking into to March, um, well, we got January and February and then looking into March and starting to uh, put this put this strategy together. Um, in March, our, our, our goal is to come to this group, the strategic leadership group, the agency coordination group, um, regional stakeholders, tribes, et cetera, to um, really an overview of the entire document, put it in a presentation and say, okay, this is what we've been gathering, putting together, um, and then a proposal for priority geographies, priority actions, uh, looking at our goals and how are we really connecting this to those uh, current investments. Understanding that it's going to be it's going to be rough, right? It's a rough draft. So starting to put that together, and then um, just talking about how we're going to put it together, and then looking at uh, how we're going to um, we want to present that and get some feedback, and then moving into April um, is really after that meeting, taking that feedback, giving us uh, a couple weeks, and then uh, kind of finalizing a rough draft to get to y'all to to take a look at, um, review that, and return that to us, um, and. Hoping for about a two-week turnaround to, to look at that information and return it. And, and really the hope here is we've been working on this um, for quite a while, so there shouldn't be anything too drastically new or different. It's the process we've been going through to gather this information and just starting to, to weave it together. Um, so getting that feedback and then um, giving us uh, two weeks to integrate that, and then in May um, looking at a re revised draft to send back to the group, hoping that – um, it's pretty much there um, where any minor tweaks and then refine that and then getting into June, which is that final report um, to finalize with that strategic leadership group. Just kind of a few thoughts on my end and then I'll open up for, for questions, comments, ideas. Um, we kind of decided to keep it within this, this group of, of 19 um, stakeholders. The expectation, the hope would be is that you're all working with, uh, with partners that aren't in this group. And, um, we want to send this out, and hopefully you take that time to work with your partners to integrate their feedback as well and, and provide that feedback into a document to us. If everyone provides feedback, that's 19 documents we're going to have to sort through and, and uh, integrate where we can. Um, we just don't really want it sent out and get 100 of them. Otherwise, it's just going to take a long time. So hopefully you're working with your groups, and, and then um, we'll go ahead and, and work at running it. So that's kind of what we're looking at for this timeline um, moving in, into the future. And then, once again, the draft outline, um, this was presented in that framework document uh, a while back and presented uh, into um, past meetings, but really what we're looking at for the draft outline of this document, um, these different aspects of it. And Once again, um, we're going to go ahead and put this, uh, this presentation on um, the web page shortly after the meeting, so if you need to dig into it a little bit deeper, feel free to, to look at this deck. The hope is it's not only this presentation, but for kind of future looking. So that's what we're looking at right here. I'll go ahead and pause um, if there's any questions, comments, thoughts on that. Uh, feel free to um, I'll open it up right now and see if you got any questions. Uh, Joseph, looks like I got you. <clears throat> Thanks. This looks like a great outline and skeleton for the um, for the plan. I have a suspicion that the the priorities, you know, especially if we get into spatially explicit maps of priorities of treatments, you know, is going to be where there's a lot of um, a lot of opinion about what that should be, and a lot of interest in the data that that informs that and such, and so. Well, I feel like, <clears throat> you know, I, I can imagine there being a good draft of this in a couple of months. Um, I, I assume you're thinking that that those prioritization maps or whatever, whatever shape it takes could is going to be like continue to be an iterative process all the way through June. Um, at least I don't know, we're going to get into this later in this meeting, but it feels like we're a long ways from having something really settled on that. Yeah. No, that's great feedback. Yeah, we will. We're going to talk about it a little bit later, um, definitely, and kind of a few thoughts there. Just a reminder of the conversations and the process we're looking at is the short-term mapping products and then the longer-term decision support. And how do we uh, get to a point within this process and then continue to build that 
um, into the future and over the next 20 years, right? So I think that's something that's that's really important. Um, and the hope would be is that um, in between these meetings, we're, we're working hard, we're grinding um, to put this stuff together, to incorporate feedback with lots of different groups. So really the idea, not only with prioritization, but all of this is that we've been working through this process throughout the whole time and and uh, the hope is, is to get there. Um, but um, I mean, that's, that's definitely really good feedback and I'd open it up to any other thoughts, comments on that as well. I guess, uh, Nate, I, I'd offer something similar to what I said at the board meeting um, last week and, and talked about in some different uh, settings, and, and that's just really just maybe a little bit more detail around what you just said, which is that in the short term, um, we're, we're kind of boxed into creating some static products uh, because that's what we can do with the time and resources we've got. Um, but the long-term goal, as Nathan described, is the development of some decision support tools that would be a little bit more dynamic um, and reflect not just changes on the physical landscape, but also changes in the social landscape um, and enable us to uh, turn some things off and on to make different decisions based on uh, what it is we're interested in looking at or investing in. Um, that's part of the work that the Institute of Natural Resources at Oregon State University is helping us to do, and I'm sure that Nathan will go into more detail. But Hopefully that helps add maybe just a little bit more context yeah, around it. Yeah, that was great. Yep. Yeah. I don't want to. Yeah, Amanda, I don't see any other ones. Go ahead. So it was brought up at the board meeting, um, the um, difficulty, I guess is maybe the right word, with engaging our federal partners to really buy in to this and utilize it within their planning mechanisms for NEPA. Um, and so I know that, you know, obviously the regional forester and the um, BLM state director are engaged with the um, SLG. <laughs> um, but I guess I'm really curious how those conversations are going or, or how you feel like they're going as far as um, you know, their their participation and sort of a, agreement to really utilize the plan um, in the, the breadth of the shared stewardship MOU within their planning mechanisms because that stuff ha happens slowly. It was, you know, we all know that NEPA is a slog. Um, so I guess what is your perspective on um, how that's going to, Play out. Do you want to take that one, or do you want? I'm happy to. Jump yeah, in go ahead and start, and I'll add, I'll tag an extend. Yeah, I mean that actually gets to the heart of some of the conversation we've had in the last couple of meetings with that group, and I've been kind of pushing some of those questions forward for them. Um, and there's no question that it's a challenge, right? Because they have their own agency priorities and processes. Um, it's also not a surprise that um, I'm not going to call any any of them out specifically, but some are further ahead than others. Um, in that discussion, uh, you know, and NRCS is there too, kind of for that private lands piece, which I think is important. Um, and I would say, um, I guess I think specifically about the Forest Service, so I guess I'll, I will call them out um, and, and say that, you know, I think we all know that they've got their 10 year strategy that they've rolled out. This is now I'm kind of a little bit of what I said in the board meeting, mm -hmm. which I know you were there. But, um, you know, they're kind of locked in for the next three years or so with kind of the chart that they, the, the path they've charted. Um, but my sense is from them that there is uh, openness to um, over that longer planning horizon, seven to ten years and, and out, openness, getting more input. Of course, we don't know how that will shake out. We don't know the uh, going to happen in D.C. versus the regional office, et cetera. And this is specifically around infrastructure, you know, so and iris on. But uh, well, that's the best answer I think I can give right now. From the conversation. I, um, Great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah. I, I, did they answer your question? Kind of. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not really su surprising yep. to answer. Um, yep. But, 
you know, in the in in light of kind of all of us feeling like this really shouldn't be a static document, we want it to be implementable. We know a lot of the work needs to happen on federal land. Yep. And if we do all this work and prioritize those landscapes, but then can't get them through the planning process is sort of all for yep. naught. So making sure that we're really playing that out on the front end I think is important. And I know from talking to partners in Washington, you know, hopefully we can ask some of those questions to DNR. Yep. Um, Cause I know that they ran into some of those issues with their plan. Yep. Um, trying to work that plan within the framework of the planning processes for the for the Forest Service in particular up yep. there. So. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to, I see Oriana and, and Pete. Um, Oriana, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I've got two questions. One is to just better understand how any concurrent processes to do uh, government to government consultation uh, with tribal governments, how that may impact this, this potential plan outline uh, timeline. And then secondly, with regard to the mapping, are there any efforts to uh, work with uh, communities who are potentially impacted by the, the information and the mapping to, to ground truth that or include any community feedback? Uh, just thinking about other recent mapping work and how that has landed oh. in, in certain parts of the state, uh, I would want to make sure that there's some, some effort to, to include those voices in that process, even if it is high level, well accepted scientific data, it can still have an impact in, in how it lands with communities and that rollout is really important. Yeah. Um, yeah, two really good questions. I'll, I'll try to address. I'll start with the tribal piece. Um, so within the tribal piece, looking at a, a kind of a tribal strategy similar to what we're laying out here, working with the uh, tribal liaisons from the agencies, um, th that group's getting together once a month, um, talking about some of this same information and laying out how we're going to do that. And really the strategy there is um, the original conversation with the tribes was to use pre-existing forums and then one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with them. So natural resource work group, cultural cluster, LCIS, still using those channels, but really within those tribal liaisons, uh, taking this information and working with those tribes one-on-one -on -one to gather that feedback and incorporate it, and then also take that strategy through the draft process to work with them as well. So kind of increasing our capacity by using our uh, pre-existing resources and bringing folks together. So hopefully that answers that one. The second piece of it is we're also looking at a more robust regional engagement strategy, working with the local partnerships and collaboratives um, to go through this process as well of uh, presenting the information, getting feedback, um, getting it in draft form, et cetera. Um, so those groups are aware and, and we're continuing that and currently having a conversation with the Oregon consensus of how to build some capacity to um, help us uh, get there over a shortened period of time. So um, hopefully that helps out and, and um, answers those questions, but we're definitely thinking about all of these aspects and, and like I said, really um, fire on all cylinders to try to get there. Hey, can I ask a quick follow-up, Pete? Is that all right? Uh, just an indirect response to that. I um, thank you for that, Nathan. I, I'm just uh, that makes sense on the tribal piece. It, who's doing that work? Um, is that I mean, because I know that there are those clusters and and um, you know pre-existing structures set up, but um, sometimes it's like they've been set up, but they they haven't really done a good job of of really um, reaching the tribes that need to be reached on topics. I've been a part of some of those efforts, unfortunately, um, and so I just want to make sure that. Um, you know, are you the one that's like direct, like, do you know that's happening? Um, or who's staffing that? Um, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to answer it the best I can. Um, I'm, I'm not staffing it. We've been, I've been presenting this information to those groups previously. Um, and this is where um, we want to continue to provide that information to the groups, but also having, since it is such a large group, having a, a more of a one-on-one -on -one engagement uh, with the tribes, those tribal liaisons, right? So we're still planning on um, working with those pre-existing channels, present information, but those groups also um, are presenting a lot of information. It's not just the 20-year strategy. So do you want to add into that, Ryan? Yeah, I can, I can add maybe a little bit. Um, and, and I would say, you know, we, we, we are working towards and would like to have a longer, just, just like all of this work, right? It's a growing body of work. And so longer term, we'd like to have a, a more developed um, plan here. But for right now, uh, 
Nathan's talking about the tribal liaisons for the different agencies that are engaged. Right. So we just added that capacity here at ODF, and most of our federal partners and uh, some of the other state agencies have had that capacity for a while. And so part of the strategy, in addition to providing regular updates in some of those forums that Nathan was talking about, is to keep those tribal liaisons up to speed about the work that's going on here so that when they are out interacting with tribes in their capacity, they can uh, create awareness, help to answer questions, mm -hmm. um, and kind of be that conduit of information. When we engaged with LCIS, middle of last year, I think, I believe so. um, you know, the, the response was to keep them in the loop about the work that's going on and let them choose um, kind of the topics that they are interested in weighing in on, a, kind of a tribe-by-tribe -tribe basis. Uh, so I don't know if that helps or muddies the waters more, but that's a little bit of kind of the, the strategy right now. Uh, I'm going to hop to Derek. I know you still have your hand up, but um, there's obviously some, some uh, reactions to this conversation. Uh, Derek and then Marco, I don't know if it's related to this one or a separate one, but just wanted to. So, Derek, so I, I, I would just add uh, and offer that um, the, the, the new um, tribal liaison here, Department of Forestry, sits uh, right across the, the office for me. And um, we've talked quite a bit about making sure that we can plan for um, very specific engagement with each of the nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon. And, and she's visited um, I, almost all of them uh, from the beginning of, of, uh, of her tenure here. And so she's learning and understanding how each tribe wants to receive information individually. And we'll be making sure that, um, you know, through Nathan being able to have validated information about the status progress, um, the, you know, uh, status of, of where we're at with the, um, with the strategy, development of the strategy, and um, some specific opportunities for input to be able to make sure that that can be brought to each tribe, and we can bring that back and incorporate it into the, the, the final 20-year strategy. I, I hope that helps just in, in how we're trying to gather that information, bring it to tribes, uh, and wrap it back into the development of the strategy. Thank you. And Marco, did you have, I'm sorry, Pete, I, I saw your hand. I don't know if it's related to this. I might call on Marco if, if it's to this topic and we'll get you here in a minute. Is that Marco, okay, Pete? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, that's fine. Okay, yeah, um, Oriana, thank you for um, bringing this up and Joseph for the follow-up. Um, and, and uh, you know, the comment earlier that out of the 19 participants, we're gonna engage our our partners and organizations we work with. This is a lot of work you folks are doing, but um, you know, in our organization, we we do have a, a tribally led um, ecosystem restoration program, and I have been keeping our our tribal team within our organization up to speed. And some of the recommendations are they're really excited to see that that government to government engagement individually is happening. We actually have. Um, representatives of the six, six tribes within Oregon, within our organization. Many of those tribal members within our organization have been on council and former administrators. And so their input and is uh, to go beyond just the government to government, which is really important. There's a whole tribal community piece that often um, gets left out from just engaging directly with, say, a natural resource department. So having input from the tribal community, I think is gonna be very important and how to make that happen. I, we have discussed this in the past, but I, I just wanna elevate that. And actually EJ Davis has been supporting us on um, some of this work around um, these listening sessions that are unrelated to this, but uh, where we're, we're inviting elected representatives and elder uh, community members. So the input, on any action on their ancestral lands, which is everywhere in Oregon, is a little more holistic. And I'm just wondering if there's a venue for that kind of engagement that goes beyond just engaging with natural resource departments, culture and heritage departments, but members who um, may have a different perspective that those are the people who elect representatives of their, of their um, nations. So I just, just wanna put that out there that, you know, thinking more holistically around that engagement is important. I think it's, I think 
think it's great input, and I, I'd love, actually, Marco, to learn more about your model and the work that you're doing. Um, and and we could, you know, as this, I guess what I would say is this effort continues to grow and mature. That may be a place that we get to. Um, I also think about the level, you know, at, at which this effort is intended to function um, and kind of where, you know, where those things intersect or don't. Um, in terms of, um, you know, kind of a high-level strategic plan at a statewide level um, that then local groups um, sort of tier to, and if some of that engagement is not uh, maybe better at, at, a, at a more local level, um, but I, I'm just kind of, you know, reacting uh, and interested in, in your thoughts there. Yeah, and, and we could talk offline. I, I and you know, I can get more advice from our team, but I, I, I think um, really both, you know, that high level, state level kind of engagement. And then, you know, I, and this could happen in the future. I'm just, it's just the feedback I've gotten as I, I, I brief our board and on, on my involvement here. And so just wanted to put that out there. And, and then uh, I'll, I'll put my hand down, but additionally, I, I think a lot about the people who are going to do the work. A lot of the people who yeah. are going to do the work on the ground probably both in the agency and ODF or um, contractors, there, there, there is the Latino Latinx workforce. Um, and Oriana, I'm glad you're here representing portions of that um, community, but um, I'm just wondering if we're missing the boat on that type of engagement and we could be more um, inclusive. So um, just throwing that out there. Yeah, Marco, thanks for that. And I'll just try to respond to that too is, um, we are looking at here sometime in the near future of getting um, some groups together for social environmental justice and kind of that equity piece. Um, then email and Oriana to try to get who are the right folks to get together to start that conversation and help us uh, integrate and intertwine some of that in the strategy. And then once again, I think what we keep getting at is the 20 year process that we need to make sure that over time we're working on this and making sure that we're integrating and keep keeping that momentum. So that feedback is, is really excellent. I think that's what we really need and expressing that. So really appreciate that. And, um, and then of course we meet here for two hours and there's a month in between. The hope is to be for all of us to be continuing this dialogue. So my phone's always available. I know, oh no, Ryan's uh, got a lot going on, but you know, these are conversations that, that we want to continue to have to, to look to a better future. So thank you on that one. And I'm, I'm going to keep us moving. Pete. Um, Everybody always gets in front of Pete. Yeah. Uh, last meeting, I was at same thing. Do and we? Then, and then we we'll, know we're uh, probably trying to move on, Nathan. Do we have time, or should I hold it? No. Yeah, go ahead. You you've been you've been patiently waiting. So um, it was go yeah. Ahead good. Carry uh, thought. Good discussion um, for sure. Important topic. Um, appreciate people weighing in. I, I guess I had two very relatively brief comments, and then a, a couple maybe a couple questions for clarification. Um, one is I I just in the last day or two, um, got some updated information from Andy McAvoy, PNW Research, who's part of the QWRA team, um, who we work closely with on the on this re latest refresh of QWRA. But they've been taking the social vulnerability index layer that OSU folks OSU developed um, as part of SB 762 in the mapping process, and now are integrating with that um, wildfire risk. And so uh, it's interesting in that when you just look at communities at risk in Oregon, it gives you sort of a ranked list. Here are the most exposed communities by housing density in Oregon. Interestingly, that list shifts pretty significantly when you then play the social vulnerability index. And so that might be something else from an equity perspective we want to be thinking of. And I don't know that Andy feels like it's ready for prime time yet, but uh, there is a draft methodology out there that I've seen, and it's it's it looks really promising. I think it's a it's a data driven way to start to incorporate some of this, and and not that it's going to answer the question, but towards Oriana's point, it can be another tool that helps us identify who we need to be talking with to ensure that the conversation is inclusive and reflective of those communities' values. So, what that's one yeah. comment. Um, second comment, I. Just on the NEPA question, I think we need to be a little bit careful and test some of our assumptions and maybe some anecdotal evidence out or anecdotal points of evidence that we might be using to say that sort of the the, the problem is NEPA. Uh, I, 
I will be the first to admit it's not a perfect system and um, it's tedious and it can take a long time to plan big complex projects. And I also know that uh, at least for the seven dry forests in Oregon and Southwest and Eastern Oregon, if you look at the data, there is an immense existing shell stock of NEPA approved acres out there ready for treatment. And that that shell stock is growing at an astronomically fast rate. So in some respects, planning is not the barrier. It's getting the money to do the work that's already been approved. And I recognize that that playing field is shifting while we are seeing a ton of money start to flow through bill and IRA. But I just want to caution us not to sort of throw NEPA under the bus before we've actually looked at the data to suggest hey, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. And some of that low-hanging fruit is some of the most impactful work that could get done to actually change the risk profile on the landscape or change resilience. So something for us to dig into. Dana Skelly at the regional office is a great resource for that, um, but just an FYI. And then I guess I had um, one question uh, around like, the what we is this outline that you have here and the, the question around whether we're ultimately needing to develop some spatially explicit maps and the question and this is just for my own understanding is 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 the assumption that in order to develop a finished plan we have to have maps included there has to be some sort of preliminary result that says these are the priority areas or can the strategy simply outline the process and the math methodology by which we will then develop those maps after the like after the process is finished and after we submit the strategy? Can you clarify that for us? Go great. Thanks for being here. That's a great question, and I, you know that's kind of been the challenge, right? So there's, uh, I guess I would honestly answer that there's probably. The process piece and what would be best, what would be good process and best process, and then there's the politics of it. And the politics of it are that folks really want to see some mapping products and see some words on paper that speak to priorities or conversation in this session. And um, so that that's what we're trying to provide. In my mind, all of this, though, you know, well, the entire conversation we've had at this point, you know, just speaks to the continuing development of this body of work of this 20-year strategy. That, and we keep talking about that. We're gonna, we're gonna have, we're gonna get to a point where we've developed some stuff in June that becomes the foundation. I think a big component of that stuff um, are some serious policy recommendations or some serious recommendations about kind of what are the next steps? What are the things that we want to develop? And to me, one of the initial first investments are those decision support tools with some more dynamic elements that really get to the thing that I think all of us would like to see and would help to drive these conversations. So I don't know if that helps, Pete, but that's, that's kind of like the situation. Um, I think we're going to move along and we're going to get into this later, but one quick follow up there is it, it seems to me like what was what Washington did. It wasn't like spatially explicit to the like treatment areas, but like watersheds that are priorities, right? Like, so when you think about yeah. those maps, they don't have to be, it's not like, here's your tax lot. You're in a high hazard zone, right? It's more like, here's a watershed that is a priority. Could that, could that suffice perhaps? We've never built any maps that go to the tax lot level around here, have we? That was intended to be a joke. No, no. Uh, I can, I can help. I can help. I can help. Yeah, that was a good joke. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and help try to address that. We're going to get into that. You know, we've been looking at the prioritization at the Hawk 10 watershed level um, is what we've been really looking at, and I think it was a conversation we had a few months back. Um, was really looking at that that level of, of watershed and then also remind you on a lot of this kind of talking about where where um, all of the partners are there are different priorities within the state etc but the idea here is to have coordinated investments and actions over the next 20 years and identifying where are these high priority areas for all the agencies and how over time do we start looking at leveraging our resources working cross boundary um, over a period of time. We may not be there. It's not like all of a sudden it's going to come out and boom, everything changes. It's a matter of moving that over time. And then a lot of conversations too of how do then we start working with those local resources, the local partners that are doing a lot of this work at a local level to understand where are those priority areas at a local level. So 
We're definitely going to dive into that more and more. It's a great question. Um, and I, I am going to transition us just for the sake of time. And first off, before I do, I'm going to apologize. Um, I put these agendas together, and, and we're off the agenda, and that's, that's my fault. So I'm going to apologize for that first and constantly trying to, um, to update, um, you know, <clears throat> making sure the level of engagement is appropriate. But I do appreciate um, those conversations. What I'm going to do is jump into capacity and readiness, and we have EJ here who's got some really good information. I want, I want to make sure that she gets to present that and then also make sure that we have plenty of time for this prioritization. So um, just real quick to set the stage, we've looked at what is the purpose of capacity readiness, the considerations, right, identifying uh, conditions that are in place for near-term implementation, um, and then where they're not in place and what the gaps are, right? And that's really uh, what we're talking about with capacity and readiness is instead of saying priority area, make a change, we want to know, well, what do, we need, what do we need to do to make that change? And looking at it in a couple of different aspects, the, space, the spatial data, the NEPA ready acres, you, you brought out of all the NEPA that's out there, what's ready, what's not, where are the areas that are, are high risk that aren't ready, and how do we do that? And some other kind of spatial data, and this is just kind of ideas um, of that spatial data, but also that local and regional groups, the, 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 the folks that are implementing this on the ground is understanding what are those capacity gaps and needs, and that's where EJ is going to dig a little bit more into. And then also our agency capacity and our tribal capacity. Um, and, and once again, continuing to develop this over a period of time and really understand that. So feedback on this, I think, is, is really important as well. So kind of high level looking at the capacity. Um, and once again, looking at some of this is trying to understand the agency capacity, um, working through the agency coordination group and the strategic leadership group and really identifying that process of how do we understand what our capacity gaps and needs. And then that tribal as well, um, those tribal liaisons, those tribal representatives, and any other feedback as well of how to really understand what are those capacity needs um, I think is really important. But uh, digging into the local and regional groups, and this is where EJ is going to present um, some great work that they've been doing, um, but kind of looking at what is that, that process for those local and, and regional groups. So um, EJ, if, I think hopefully that's a good transition. If you want to go ahead and take I'm going to stop, stop sharing. But I just wanted to kind of set that stage of what when we uh, keep diving in capacity or readiness, kind of where we're at. Um, Sure. Thank you, Nathan. Um, unfortunately, I do need to depart shortly before three o'clock, so I'm going to tighten this up. Um, but I welcome anyone to follow up with me and further discussion. So this qualitative capacity assessment is intended to help get at that part of Senate Bill 762 that says we want to understand communities that have capacity and where capacity needs to be built. This doesn't address all of that question, but it focuses specifically on where we know there are existing all lands partnerships and collaborative groups. And it's a way to kind of assess where are these groups active? What do they do and not do? What are the barriers they face and what are their needs and their interests for the strategy in their own words? Uh, this is, you know, comes before which what's hopefully some deeper engagement through focus groups um, and more direct involvement, but I think it, I hopefully it will be useful. Um, and those of you who know me know that I have dedicated my career to being like very over-focused on forms of collective action and defining those. And so this is something I was interested in offering to the strategy and I hope it's useful. We developed some inclusion criteria for this, which I'm happy to discuss. Um, these inclusion criteria kind of get at more of the different forms that the groups take. And it's meant to be inclusive of different kinds of partnerships that make sense in different social and ecological contexts. So that means that things like focused investment partnership oak networks are in this, as well as sage grouse uh, local implementation teams, as well as federal forest collaboratives, as well as all lands partnerships of different sizes and scales. Um, I'm happy to go into much more detail about any of this. We just don't have a ton of time. We worked really diligently with a subcommittee of the ASIC group to formulate these questions. Quite a lot of group work, expert review, a couple of you on here provided that. We administered this in November. We also pulled together all the existing plans and documents for each group because there's a really strong interest in understanding how this matches with local priorities that already exist. The, the universe of groups that we sought out was 36 groups and I've received 28 responses, which is pretty good. So that's a 78% response rate. Um, I won't bore you with my methods, but to note this technically isn't a survey because it wasn't sent out to all members of all these groups. We asked for one response per group to really get 
um, a profile of, of their strengths and capacities. Some of these groups chose to um, complete that by actually sitting down together in a meeting and workshopping it, and others, the coordinator or leader, felt able to fill it out on their own. What this gets us, um, there's a lot of different things we can do with this information and to inform the plan. So each individual group, now we have a detailed profile, depending on how detailed they were in filling it out, of their different capacities, barriers, and needs. This can also be summarized by any regional grouping. Um, and there's also some common themes across the state, which I'm going to focus on today, given the scope of this group. Uh, we also are creating a spatial overlay of where each group operates, recognizing that each group obviously may not have relationships or projects in every square foot of an area they say they work in, but just kind of acknowledging what are the different areas these groups define themselves as being out in. Um, I want to remind you this is a qualitative assessment, meaning that it's not really about quantifying, it's not about metrics of capacity, it's it's sort of these in-context rich themes of, from these groups and their experience doing this work. It's also self-reported, and if any of you have done these personality quizzes in work or anything like that, you know, sometimes some of us are hard on ourselves and sometimes some of us are a little more generous with ourselves. So there's some of that. This is also confined by what we chose to look at. So there may be other kinds of capacities that we didn't end up asking about. This is only a snapshot of how groups um, work on the things we asked about. And also this gets again at existing groups or groups that fit a certain definition. It doesn't get at all kinds of community capacity. I wanna be really clear about that. So having just said that, I'm faking you out. Here's some numbers. Um, we looked at 58 different kinds of capacities across um, seven or eight different bins, um, different skills for acquiring and managing funding, uh, managing partnerships, planning capacities, monitoring outreach education, cultural burning, equity, and environmental justice. And these are the self-reported scores. Please don't take a picture of this or take this to the bank. I'm having to redo the analysis because we had several stragglers submit this week. And I also am trying to be thoughtful about when and how we share out this kind of information. Because again, I, as I said, it's kind. Of, this is the one part that kind of quantifies these capacities there's some sensitivities here. But so here are some of the groups in different parts of the state that self-reported as having a fair number of the capacities that we are looking at. I'm going to just go back to the state, kind of these state level observations to finish up, given this is the state group. Um, we asked, we had pick lists of top barriers specific to different arenas, the functioning of partnerships and organizations specific to planning, specific to implementation. These are some of the top barriers that came up. Um, as a social scientist, I often feel like I go out and find obvious things and then tell them to the people who already know this. So a lot of this is not news to you all, but um, I think it's really important to underscore some of these, these themes around the lack of um, agency participation, lack of agency capacity, stable funding sources, running out of easy acres in some places, but not in others per se. Um, and then some of those challenges to implementation. I think what's important to note is that these are um, there are a lot of sub-regional differences, and so I'm hopeful that the way this can inform the strategy is not by lumping too much. We asked specific questions about what's needed to increase different, to work on different aspects of landscape resiliency. So these are the things that were said to be important for increasing the pace or the timeline of, of planning and implementation. Again, none of these are very surprising, but um, there are some more specific recommendations in there. We asked what's needed to increase the scale. And some of these are the same uh, as increasing pace, and some of these are different, particularly looking at more how we use fire on the landscape um, and how we engage all, all managers across the landscape. What's needed to increase quality and a really strong emphasis on, invol on um, robust monitoring, funding for monitoring, and making a serious long-term commitment to that. What's needed to actually increase cross-boundary coordination, so not just acres that happen to get done near each other and we call it a win, but the meaningful strategic coordination of cross-boundary treatments um, really focuses on explicitly noting that we need to invest in that and we need to bring a diversity of partners to the table. Um, so I have a lot of more detail on each of these by each group, and there are also more specific recommendations. Again, I'm just reporting on some generic things for this committee at this point. Um, I got a lot of feedback on what their expectations and hopes are for this strategy. And one prominent theme was the importance of it respecting local priorities, um, the desires of local communities and not being a top-down exercise, all of which I'm sure you've all heard and talked about. Um, and there's quite a few suggestions about that, as well as the emphasis on sustainable funding for capacity. And this really does align with prior research that colleagues and I have done about collective action groups. We, we rely on them a lot. We 
assume they're going to be there for us when we have big plans like this. Um, but a few years ago, I found that for, for the federal forest collaboratives, at least half of them are entirely reliant on ODF's federal forest restoration program grants. So we really need to think seriously about what we're asking, um, how we're relying on these local groups and the funding they actually receive. What next? Um, so I got four responses this week past the deadline. I'll analyze those. I'm presenting the findings, um, a full data set and summarize findings to our, our um, subcommittee. We'll talk about and receive direction from the team about how they want to integrate this. We'll build a spatial layer that shows the where these groups are active that can hopefully be part of the prioritization process. And I'm hopeful that we can use the what we've learned here to have some fo regional focus groups that get into these in more detail. Thanks. There's a lot more there. Sorry, that was just a little taste. Yeah, thanks, EJ. I apologize once again, a little late on the agenda. We'll answer questions. If there's questions, comments, would go ahead and run if you need to, and I'll try to answer them the best I can, um, and then we'll, we'll kind of move on. So it's open I, it up. I can stay um, one more minute if anyone has an immediate reaction or thought. Um, there's just a lot of good information here that I'm glad to have gotten. Yeah, Marco. Uh, EJ, can you explain what that uh, local um, focus group ingredients for that are how does that work like how would you organize that and who are the who are the members that's part of Nathan's region uh, the the regional engagement strategy that's coming up and I think that's TBD I recommend that those probably be organized at some regional scale so that groups of people with similar with similar interests can kind of have a meaningful dialogue um, so wanting to kind of go deeper on some of the things we asked here and get into more detail than you can when you're asking people to fill out something online. Thank you. EJ, were there any major regional gaps where you didn't get responses or notable groups where you felt like, ah, shoot, we without this group, we we feel like we're missing some critical data? Actually, it's okay for a little while, not to call anyone out, essential organ groups actually were not responding and I was concerned about that, but they came through this week. So um, I think it's it's pretty decent coverage. I, I guess sometimes the picture is hardest to put together on the West side because you have it's such a diversity of different kinds of groups there from the Federal Forest Collaboratives and the Cascades to these Oak groups. And there were a couple groups in the West side that did not respond that I was don't know much about that I was hoping to learn more about. And then the group I reached out to in the Umqua, Umqua Oaks did not respond. So as often in these state plans, it does feel like Douglas County is a little less. Sorry, I have to go. It was great to see you all. Thanks for the time. Yeah, EJ, thank you. We really appreciate that. I'm looking forward to kind of digging a little bit more. And um, just a reminder is, taking that information and integrating it into into the strategy and then continue that over the next 20 years right um, really starting that understanding it i think a lot of the stuff we generally understand but really getting that feedback and hoping to uh, continue that on uh, marco to answer your question I'll, I'll try to hit on it that's the conversation that um, working with uh, oregon consensus right now to help build some capacity to look at how we can get those regional groups and we're kind of looking at them um, within that uh, kind of sage grasslands, uh, the dry forest and the wet forest to start there. But what we really want to do is engage those groups and say, how, how should we break this up? What works and what do we want to get out of this? But it's the idea is really uh, building a two-way dialogue within the strategy development um, over the next 20 years, understanding the capacity, understanding the funding, all the things that go into that. But I don't want to come down with this, down, this top-down approach and, and figure out how to link all the great work that's happening at the local level, all the great work that's happening at the state level, and really working on this strategy over the next 20 years together. So more to come on that um, for sure. I hope, hope next time to, to have a little bit more of a solid of a game plan. I have a quick question. Yeah, please. Um, just want to make sure I'm not talking over anybody online, but Amanda here in the room. Um, so uh, I heard last week that uh, at a meeting last week that the Forest Service, I think, and OSU maybe with Chris Dunn, are looking at redrawing um, some of the pods, the potential operational delineation on the Umpqua and the Rogue. Um, and there's uh, sort of two types of pods. There's P pods, which are kind of in you know, the planning pods, and then I can't remember what the other one is, but you know, more the operational pods. Um, 
Is that what they're called? Oh, pod? I don't know. I can't remember yeah. exactly what word it comes in front of pods for that one. But um, but uh, for the planning pod, you know, looking at kind of larger landscapes and how we plan treatment, that could be something that we um, kind of get in incorporated in. And, and I know that that's, you know, there's the Forest Service is trying to develop a local approach to draw those with the right people in the room and such that that results in good outcomes that make sense, you know, having something like that be a starting point, you already know that you're getting some local um, knowledge yep. within that framework. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, yep. You know, I, I don't know exactly who's going to be in the room at those yeah. <laughs> meetings, but I know that they're trying to get a bigger diversity of, of folks um, that actually yeah. have on-the-ground knowledge uh, this time around. So. Yes, that's good. I'll try to address some of that. And that's actually um, in conversation with Washington DNR. I know they're looking at pods and potential control lines, PCLs, I think, was part of that. So they're going to talk a little bit about that, which is going to be nice. Um, the other thing is my limited knowledge in pods, the potential operation delineations, for those that aren't familiar with it, it has to be a very grassroots uh, kind of collaborative effort. It can't just be someone in, in Salem drawing lines and saying this is where those, those pods lines. And that also, that also requires uh, buy-in, acceptance, and it's not uniform over the state, right? Mm -hmm. The conversation was, do we break this up into pods? But no, we don't because we need to get that total buy-in. But yes, I hope that those conversations will continue. And I'm sure there's a lot of folks here that um, have thought about pods, et cetera. Um, and I might divert some of the conversation unless people really want to talk about pods. But what's that? Uh, Oriana, you got something? Yeah, quick question and then a quick comment. Uh, the question is, what kinds of stakeholders are you trying to reach? Or, or rather, what kinds of uh, interest groups are, are you trying to reach? Or kinds of, of, of folks are you trying to reach through these regional conversations? Is this more like true on the ground community? Or is it more kind of the organizational, like institutional capacity in, in different uh, areas? Yeah, good good question. Um, so really really starting with the uh, shared stewardship MOU, as we've really been looking at the foundation, it calls out the 26 uh, forest collaboratives as part of that uh, overall strategy, but then also understanding there's the, uh, the partnerships as well, the all land partnerships. Uh, the hope would be is that those all land partnerships are uh, have governance, have prioritization, uh, funding mechanisms, right, to implement this work. But we're trying to understand more, do, do they and are they incorporating all the groups? Um, and once again, instead of going from like a high level to try to understand on the ground, how are we working and building a, a more robust network and really going through that partnerships and all ants, or I'm sorry, collaboratives and all ants partnerships. But once again, as we go through this journey over the next 20 years, um, we're probably going to learn a lot as well, and that's kind of that overall that we're trying to get to. Um, but I'd also like feedback as I'm still learning. There's, you look at the state here. There's a lot of partnerships and collaboratives compared to some other states where there's there's not. And how and this is where having EJ really helping us understand this of how how are they how are we functioning? What are the barriers, um, et cetera. So oh, hopefully that helps. But also any insight would love to hear as well what we'll, what we're missing. Yeah, that is helpful. It may be, I think, beneficial to have like regional conversations between collaboratives, but then also to the extent that you have budget and uh, Oregon consensus or other other folks who are involved have capacity is have more local conversations that are a little bit more like a town hall or open to the community, because not everyone in a community is represented by a collaborative, even if those collaboratives do really good and important work, there's still kind of a certain level of privilege and engagement that comes in those spaces that can can be representative of communities, but in particular for um, uh, BIPOC communities in, in different rural areas, that, that's a, a very underrepresented side. So I'd also encourage some questions related to the capacity to engage with, like as Marco was saying, like the Latino, Latina or Latinx workers um, or other workers in the community uh, who are engaging with people who, who use the forest recreationally in the community or who are dependent on gathering firewood, like just understanding some of those different factors that don't always kind of reach the collaborative level, I think is an important piece. And then uh, my my comment is to, to just better understand, um, I think, or better set expectations related to the regional and local conversations. Um, it's, it's one thing to engage people, 
but people really need to understand how their feedback is going to be taken into account. It can feel really invalidating for a community to feel like, oh, this is gonna, this is gonna be more grassroots, but if ultimately it is this group that is making decisions and, and synthesizing information from community, then that needs to be really clear because it does not sit well, especially in, in more rural communities who are used to being poorly represented by Western Oregon or, or kind of the traditional stakeholders in the room to, to feel like their voice has been heard, but then it's kind of been lost in an echo chamber. So just being really realistic about how different voices are being incorporated or not from the get-go will help people set expectations and not feel like they're getting a process that they're not getting. But of course, striving to really have those regional or local voices be, be incorporated into conversations in meaningful ways is, is the goal. But if that's not possible in certain ways, it's better to be clear about that from the get-go than, than try to you know, feel feel uncomfortable about it and not name it as as may be needed for some communities who appreciate just directly understanding what what the impacts will be. Yeah, that's great. And I'll I'll just kind of real quickly respond with my thoughts and then jump to John here and we'll transition to prioritization. The the first part of that is also um, what's the best delivery? Uh, maybe not ODF to be doing that local town hall communications and how do we work with the right groups and identifying those groups are some of the things that I think um, we want to make sure that that we're connecting over the long term. Um, so just that was just a thought off the top of my head. And then also on the second part and the first part is yes, and, and we need help, right? And how do we do that? And that's why getting your feedback and your input, I think, is really important to make sure that as we continue to build this strategy out over time is that we're doing that, understanding, of course, all the restraints that we're all against with capacity and funding, all stuff, but building a system that could actually function, I think is important. So I really appreciate that. Just a quick final comment. If you're going to resource Oregon consensus, those resources might better go to the collaboratives themselves to do that work and then work with those collaboratives to identify who they're representing and who they're not. Like that local capacity within communities is more trusted sometimes than an entity like Oregon consensus can be, even if they do really good and important work across the state. Um, and that resources going into local communities as part of a process like this is a really important potential outcome rather than just having them be facilitated. There are people in communities around the state who can do that work. So I'll get off my soapbox now. I appreciate having some space to talk through this. Yeah, thank you. That's really good feedback. And I hope to have kind of deeper conversations on that with you and, and anyone else who wants to. So thank you, uh, John. And then we'll transition to prioritization. Uh, yeah, as this conversation has been going on, it just kind of uh the question comes to mind how much the landscape is covered by these partnerships and collaboratives is it uh to a certain extent get a lot of it or is there some big holes and places that really need treatments that just aren't repre represented in this yeah. fashion yeah great question john that was part of the survey was to understand that and we're getting the uh, spatial representation of those geographic boundaries and asking those groups, can you send that to us? And then we're looking at plotting that on a map to understand uh, what is covered and what is not, and what are the groups in those areas, and, and dig a little bit deeper of kind of what are their goals, what are they trying to achieve, et cetera. So great question and, and hoping to bring some of that in here pretty soon. But once again, we're just kind of getting the information and teasing through it. I have just a quick comment that yep. should tie into the next yep. piece. So, um, you know, in relation to some of the work that those collaboratives and partnerships have done, some of them already have strategies that do yep. prioritize landscapes. And I know I sent you information and people may be aware that, for instance, like the Umatilla has a new story map on prioritization and their yep. model around that. So, um, can we get that spatial data to incorporate into our maps? to again address what EJ was talking about so we aren't so top down, right? We have yeah. that top down information, but we're all also kind of filling in from the bottom up with what's already been produced to then create something, a strategy that's really um, robust and, and, and looks at both yeah. um, kind of layers of information. Great question. Well, you know, we can just have a conversation here. <laughs> I have an answer to that. Okay. But I'll wait. Hold it on your finger. Oh, you don't forget. This, this happened to us last time. 
Yeah, I lost the video. Why recording? <laughs> Twice the other day. And everyone's probably going to be. Hopefully you didn't think it pretty off, right? We can hear you. You're just frozen. Or at least for oh, me. Oh, my God. Well, good. We can keep talking then. Yeah. Well, thanks. So we didn't say anything. Uh, so Pete, that you shouldn't hear. So I'll, I'll keep. I'll keep talking then. Thanks, Pete. Um, to, to answer that question, I think that was a previous comment as well. Is how far does this thing go? Go? How far does the geographic prioritization go down? What is that level? And how do once again we support all the work that's happening in the local resource and the, and the local um, areas? So. Um, I think that's what we're, we're constantly wrestling with, and, and with that, I, I am going to transition. Uh, Dan, I don't know if you want to go ahead and start jumping into yours. We can't see you yet, but I'm assuming that everyone else can, and um, the show must go on. So, does that work for you? Yeah, we got a presentation. Oh. Uh, yeah, let's, let's see if this works. Um, let me try to share my screen. <clears throat> All right. Um, All right, give me a signal. Can you guys see this, hear me? Huh. I can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. We, we can hear you in the room. <laughs> it got yeah. really quiet really fast. All right, um, and I'll just say like, my audio has been kind of um, staticky. So if I'm staticky, let me know. And I don't know, I'm not sure what I can do about it, but we, we can try to play with things. All right, so my goal here is to talk to, to take us into the maps um, and to the prioritization process. Um, and, you know, th there's been a, we sort of veered onto that topic a lot through this conversation. And um, one of the questions is, was like, you know, how far are we going to go at, at how deep? And um, I think, you know, Ryan basically said what I was going to say, which is, as far as we can, but only as far as we can, you know, with sort of agreement among everybody that sort of needs to be agreed upon on this. And if we can't, then we'll have to sort of step back up to a process. But my hope is that we get to something that we can actually have geographic priorities. And then the question is, what are those and how do we define them? So I want to take you on, and I was sort of hoping to get to a kind of proposal now. Well, we don't, it turns out making the gathering information is one thing, making decisions is a lot more challenging. Um, and so I'm going to take you on the journey that we've been on in the hopes of gathering your um, reactions and thoughts and input on any part of it, uh, much as you've done so far, because this has been a great conversation. So at the last SLG meeting, or maybe even one before that, we asked the question, you know. How do we define these geographic priorities? And we've, there's a lot of sort of considerations that came up. Um, you can see them on the left here. And the answer we got was wildfire risk. Um, and some of the comments that were made from the SLG were like, you know, reason for our existence is to treat areas of high fire risk, and we're here because of the wildfire threat. So that was really clear. Doesn't mean that these other things, the restoration needs, social vulnerability, or other values are not still important, but it just in terms of like what sort of is the overriding purpose here. Um, and so that dovetails also quite well with um, you know, our task and its, and its definition here of prioritizing restoration actions and geographies for wildfire risk reduction. So in 762, there is this um, set of text I think it's more directed towards the uh, projects um, than it is towards the 20 year strategy, but it's also still quite helpful to look at these and say, you know, the things that they wanted us to prioritize around. Um, and when you sort of look at the, um, you know, high wildfire risk, it's really these four uh, highest ENVC classes. So we started looking at that um, and we, it turns out that all of the data that we've been collecting, um, you have to look under the hood a little bit and you find out that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice it, to understand it and to parse it um, and, to, and to use it appropriately. Um, and here's one example of that. So with the 
uh, with the Q QWRA and the EMVC classes, it turns out there's two different ways to even kind of identify the top four classes. And one of them is by summing. So I don't know if this will be helpful, but essentially like every 30 meter pixel gets a, a number based on the fire potential and its effects on um, uh, the, the values we care about, the uh, highly valued assets, the HVAs. And so, um, and those themselves have been weighted already, right? And so um, if you, you can take these watersheds that we've identified, these HUC-10 watersheds, and you can sum all those 30 meter, uh, you can basically add those up and you can get a number. Um, or you can take the mean. Um, and it turns out when you do the, when you do that, you get two different answers depending on which one you choose. The sum is, is depicted on the left, and it gives you about 14.8 14 14 million acres, whereas taking the mean gives you 20.9 million acres. Um, and you can see sort of where the difference lies. Over here, you capture a lot of the Columbia Plateau, where over here, you don't. Um, over here, you capture some of these areas sort of moving west, where in this area here, some of this is dropped out. Also over around uh, John Day and Legrand and such. So basically, we're still wrestling with this question and starting to talk with Chris Dunn and others to kind of understand uh, how, to, how to think about this. Similarly, with the forest disturbance restoration need, um, if we were to use this data, it also can be um, sliced and diced and parsed in various ways. So on the left, um, we have uh, a showing of, basically what this shows is the percent of forest land requiring disturbance-based restoration. So treatment, uh, some sort of uh, thinning or fire of some sort, um, uh, to return it to a condition similar to that which was present prior to European settlement, okay? So we can quibble with all of this, um, but sort of what this shows is, you know, 10% versus 55 or even more percent of the forest land area requiring that restoration treatment area, right? And so you can sort of get a sense of like where it's way out of whack and where it's less so. Um, and so then the question becomes, well, what do you, what do you choose? Do you choose the 25%? Um, or the 30% or the 35% or the 40% in each, in each case, you get, um, you know, in this case, reduced numbers based on, you know, sort of uh, the higher you go with that percentage. So we're still kind of working with the, um, the folks that put this together, Ryan Haugo and Demea and Pete has been really helpful in terms of bringing those folks together with us. We just had a conversation yesterday um, that, Focus primarily on the QWRA and the recognition that, going back to this previous slide, that maybe um, even just using this this QMBC class as sort of single number is not the best approach to take. So we're still wrestling with that as well. Um, then going on to the rangeland restoration need, we have this data from uh, SageCon, which shows the core areas that they've identified as needing um, you know, sort of uh, restoration work. And then the, um, uh, the, what do you call this? The sort of larger landscape priority, design priority landscapes, which is sort of the exterior of that. Um, and so we're working with folks at SageCon to kind of understand that better as well. Tried to sort of as we started thinking about this, we started with an approach that said, "Okay, um, how do we prioritize near term versus long term?" And um, we thought that maybe we could set up some criteria. So if we just focused on um, wildfire risk, um, then maybe and only maybe um, that would mean focusing on just the the top four ENVC classes as this shows. And then um, perhaps in future years, once we have a more robust system, um, sort of a, the, the decision support system that we've talked about with you last time, um, we might kind of 
bring out more, more uh, components that restoration need, the ecosystem areas of high insect and disease work, where agencies are already doing this work, um, where wildfires already occurred, future risk factors such as moisture deficit. Um, and um, so then we started asking, do any of these areas, should any of these be brought into the initial one to three years that we would put out in June? With the idea that we want the smallest geographic area that sort of uh, satisfies the remaining criteria, whatever we choose. Well, I will tell you that in our discussions within ASIG and the prioritization work group, um, most of these had a vote by one or other agency or person. And so it turned out that we weren't, you know, I'm still sort of thinking about the, the comment that if you prioritize everything, you prioritize nothing. And so, so far we have not kind of um, come to a clear sense of like, what's the appropriate way to focus here? And how do you defend that? How do you sort of make that a defensible choice? Um, you know, 35% restoration versus 40% restoration, um, et cetera, et cetera. So last week, and then this is sort of like very recent, we sort of started taking a different approach, um, trying a different approach. Um, which is to say, um, so if we were to suggest, let's let's take a, let's create a base map with the forest restoration need at 35% or greater, and the sagebrush conservation areas uh, at 10% or greater, um, and then overlay um, uh, other information on top of it to see how that fits. So we started looking at wildfire and how that overlays with this, the wildfire perimeter history for the last 10 years. And you can see that using this information, some of it's captured and most of it's captured, but some of it's not. Um, and then looking at agency activity areas, and this is just uh, version one of this, uh, looking at the uh, U.S. Forest Service and the All Lands and the Joint Chiefs, um, BIL Priority Area, CFLRP overlaying on that. It mostly connects, but not 100% certainly. There's definitely uh, missing parts there. Uh, this is another um, version of, this is the FFRP and Good Neighbor Authority uh, work being done, how it overlaps. Um, and then this is the wooey risk, um, and you can sort of see where that overlaps and doesn't. Um, and then, so then we started thinking about what is the, so <laughs> that, that's sort of where we got um, with that. And then we started thinking, okay, we, we haven't been able to sort of narrow it down in, a, in an appropriate way yet. So we started thinking, okay, let's go big instead of going small and start thinking about what is the overall um, treatment area that we need to think about over the long term, uh, over the 20 years, given our current data. And so this gives you a sense of, of some of the layers that we kind of put in here, the National Insect and Disease Map, the Climate Moisture Deficit, Forest, Rangeland Restoration Need, plus uh, the uh, fire intensity, burn probability, and susceptibility information from the QWRA. And what <laughs> it turns out, even that, um, uh, you can look at it in two different ways. And I want to note that this is kind of using available data. I put this over here um, because the recognition is that this, is, this information is going to change over time, um, over the course of 20 years. And we're going to get new data. We're going to get better data. We're going to uh, have a new QWRA at some point, probably two or three over the course of this 20-year period. Um, so uh, anyway, and then there's two different ways of, of looking at this data. One is to rank it. Um, and the other is to you know, rescale it. And I have to admit now, this 
these maps came to me today. I was hoping that Sean from INR would be on the phone, on the line here with us. His email went down today or his sort of internet went down today. So I don't know if he's on or not. Um, but uh, I was hoping that he could explain the difference between these. Um, but anyway, what I wanted to show you is sort of like where we are on this journey of trying to figure out um, a way to uh, defensively identify priorities for the near term while we start um, you know, putting together this more long-term decision support system that we can continually update and revise these priority areas based on changing needs and changing fires, new fires and new work that's being done so that hopefully, you know, areas that show up in dark now after, you know, two or three years of treatment will turn out to be light like Salem and we can move on to other areas. So that's the process that we're involved in now. That is, I believe, yeah, my last um, uh, slide. And the what I'm hoping for is to give you a sense of just how we're thinking about this. Um, we've tried a few things. They haven't yet worked, so we tried other things. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll say one more thing on, on sort of looking at these two maps. What I like about these is that they give you a sense of what needs to be done now and what needs to be done in the future and how nearly all of the state is probably going to get treatment and attention over the course of 20 years. Um, and it helps us sort of identify where we need to start now um, to take care of the most urgent needs um, while we, and once we've sort of done that to a, an appropriate level and we need to decide what that level is, sort of what, the, what is the definition of resilience and how do we know when we've achieved it so that we can then move on to somewhere else um, and then turn sort of more towards maintenance in a certain area. So, um, and then we haven't even started overlaying, for example, all the capacity readiness information because that would affect where we can sort of put money in the near term versus long term and, and all of that. So lots of things that we are wrestling with. And I just wanted to bring you along on the journey with us. And I would be very interested in any reactions, comments, and <laughs> uh, helpful insights that could take us uh, further along on this, on this path. Hey, hey, Dan, I'll step in here. I don't know if you can see um, everyone. I'll, I'll go ahead and facilitate if you're okay with that, and then you can sure, run the slides. I, I did see that, uh, Mike, you had your hand raised a few slides back, but uh, if you have a question, comments, et cetera, uh, go ahead and we can always toggle between different slides here as needed. No, that's inadvertent. I didn't mean to put my hand up. Oh, no worries. I thought you had a wonderful thought that uh, to provide. So if there's any others, uh, that's what, once again, like normal, a lot of information, um, but uh, yeah, questions, comments, thoughts, insight. Uh, Marco. Yeah, I had a question about um, a couple slides back. Um, just just wanted some clarity. I, I believe it was before the Good Neighbor Authority. Um, See, it, things yeah, are, I, it may have things been on top of things here. So let's see. kind of your all lands projects on there. You, you mentioned joint chiefs and um, right. Go back one, one of the purple, the purple circles. Go back one. Okay. Right there. There. I don't mean okay. to make you drive the slide, the, the slide slides again. <laughs> so, so Dan, is this? Um, can, can you explain this? Just give me a more more insight on this one. I I just want to understand it better. And so I, I, don't, it, I don't mean to take up more, too much time here. It could be really quick. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So the high risk fire sheds in the high uh, from which is all lands and USFS only. Uh, actually, Nathan, is, is that coming from the yeah. wildfire, the federal wildfire risk? Um, I'm forgetting the name now. I'll, Go for it. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll happily take this one. Um, so once again, looking at the, the kind of gray and, and dark gradient was uh, kind of the prioritization piece in the back. But there's been a lot of questions of where are we currently prioritizing within the agencies and where are we currently doing our work? And so what we did was from feedback from this group and, and from um, stakeholder, I'm sorry, from um, the, the ASIG was um, let's get that information. So we reached out and we got the information. So this is showing um, what are either prioritization. So there's that, I, I think I, I can't fully see it, but the bill priority landscape for the U.S. Forest Service is looking at priority areas. This is looking at um, where Joint Chiefs is currently sitting. Um, once again, from, from the data that we're getting, and it was a conversation earlier. What's, we've, there's already a lot of priorities, and how does this strategy um, help us? And the idea is that we're priority actions coordinate investment. So you can see that we're, we're in a lot of different places, but over time, how do we start to really look at um, those investments, those actions in the landscapes to make sure that they are um, unified within the agencies, thinking about the right fu funding sources in the right spots to make sure we're achieving the capacity um, achieving the on-the-ground implementation, et cetera. So this is what, the hard part there, too, is when you take six agencies with all the different stuff is it just turns into this mass. We're trying to look at high level, where are we currently looking at those priorities and investments? And I think this gives us a snapshot of we're, we're all over the state, um, which I think is good, And but how do we also start to integrate that? And that's the next one, too, with our FFR program is where is that work being done and, and, and. So hopefully that helps provide some clarity of this. It's just also really hard to spatially represent that. No, thank you for that. Appreciate you taking a moment. Yeah, of course. Joseph? Joseph, do you have a question? Joseph may be frozen. Right. Yeah. I have lost Joseph. Other other thoughts, questions. When Joseph hops back in, we'll get we'll get his questions. While we're waiting, you know, I'll, I'll just sort of comment on the previous question. I mean, part of looking at this slide, sort of helps us understand where agencies are already working because we would want to be perhaps sort of building on that work. Um, but also it helps us, helps the agencies say like, are they currently working in the areas that we've identified as being the highest priority? And maybe are there in future iterations of these priorities for different agencies, can they be um, sort of shifted towards our shared priority areas to some better degree. Um, I think there's sort of two uses there. I appreciate that, Dan. And, and I know this is focused on, you know, prioritization and, but um, there might be a little more detail. And, and this is why I asked the question in, in uh, the participants that could crosswalk to that readiness and capacity need because within within those agency projects, there's a lot of partners that are non-agency. And, yeah. and, and I know it's different than the intent of this, but just thinking about that piece, you know, as far as capacity for implementation. Right. Marco, is your thinking that in these areas, because there's already projects or priorities sort of established that there might be more capacity and readiness in those areas? among the communities as well, or not so much? Yeah, I mean, I w without di digging further into it, yes. I mean, and, and you know, that other things that we might think about is what long-term agreements are in place, not just uh, federal programs like CFLR or Joint Chiefs, but um, long-term stewardship agreements. I know you got good neighbor authority on the next slide, but um, kind of that highly functioning partnership piece and uh, different state investments as well through ODF or OWEB as, as you know, helping to shape that readiness and capacity piece and, you know, that, that, those questions. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I yep. appreciate that. Jim. And, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, it's kind of, again, I'm um, watching the mapping overlays and stuff during this last 15, 20 minutes. And, um, 
first question that pops in my mind is the mapping overlays, were they done really just in, I'll just say the evaluation of the entire, or of the entire state or just purely focused in on forested areas? And the reason I'm asking is you do obviously have some urban areas in here. Southern Oregon obviously stands out, Bend, um, Redmond Sisters, you know, et cetera. But you've also got chunks of this state um, that wound up in a wooey call in terms of risk mapping, uh, having been through that exercise as well. And I'm just wondering if there's some usefulness of this work pointing to maybe some of those areas of focus uh, for treatment in some of the areas that land in wooey. Because it's clear that, you know, the entire, I'll just say Western Oregon, uh, Willamette Valley, Eugene to Salem, not much um, sitting in this area, which is what I would expect, especially when you're evaluating it against some of these higher, um, these other overlays in terms of where that risk is at and where that treatment um, focus needs to be. Yes. Um, and yeah, and so what I'm showing now on the map is the wooey uh, fire risk showing in, in red the extreme risk and in orange the high risk. And what you can see there is where it overlaps and does not with the, the grade area, which is sort of the area, it's, it, it's sort of our, our test case, our beta case of like, um, if we chose this, how, does it, how do other things um, overlay on top of it? Um, and so this is just giving you a sense of like, now we have some information that it does and doesn't in certain places. Um, and now we need to figure out, okay, what does that mean? And what, what are the implications for us? And what do we need to do about that? Because part of what I'm thinking is, again, part of the struggle over the last couple of years, aside from mapping overlays and trying to figure out how to represent risk, is ultimately where you're going to put resources um, long term. Because we don't have an infinite amount of money. Um, we were fortunate to get the tranche that went out the door in the last couple of years. But that's literally a, it's pixie dust in, in the scheme of what needs to be treated. And this seems to me to be a pretty valuable visual um, to help inform where really that focus needs to be. And I don't want to suggest, forget about everything else, but clearly over the next, I don't know what the time frame is, five years, over 10 years. I mean, this isn't going to get uh, taken care of for decades, but at least the priorities are pretty laid out from a visual standpoint um, with these types of overlays. Yeah. And just, just so that I'm clear, we, um, if you were prioritizing, would WUI fire risk be a pretty high priority component? Well, I, I think that's that's part of the, the thing that folks are trying to figure out. I'll, have to say, I kind of go back and forth in my mind. I mean, it, I think the intent when we got into 762 and that mapping exercise is that clearly the focus needed to be in the extreme and high risk areas. Um, and this helps, I think, illustrate where those lay, especially in proximity to these other high risk zones. But there's also a chunk of risk areas out there that don't fall into um, some of these other risk overlays. And I, again, like I said, it's a matter of trying to prioritize limited resources out there. Um, it should be something that looks out. I mean, if you're a city, I'll just use Ashland as an example. I think, I don't wanna say they've got things figured out, but I mean, they've been doing it for a couple of decades. Um, they've had some success on mitigating, you know, the scale of risk that's out there. There's some other examples around the state and some of these urban settings that have done it too. But I think part of the, the debate or the, um, the dialogue that's out there is, I think, again, sucking up potentially too much land into those risk categories that may not necessarily be at that risk level that needs to be treatment. And I think this type of a layer or additional layer of some mapping helps illustrate or at least inform some of those decision making. So that if you've got areas, again, maybe it's Eugene, maybe it's Salem, um, that show up in some of these maybe high risk areas, 
but aren't in an area that is realistically at risk in comparison to everything else, I wouldn't be spending the money there. I'd be spending the resources in the other areas that have a much higher th threshold for risk. Thank you. Joseph? Uh, just getting some clarity here. My, my, it, so the black through gray are the QRA. That's the QRA data. QRA plus um, restoration need and okay. uh, rangeland restoration need. So right, so if you, were, if you were to pull out the restoration need, then kind of what Jim's talking about would be more prevalent in that data because the QRA did consider risk to communities, right? Yes. Okay, so, and I guess that's a question. If, if we use this sort of watershed prioritization, but elevated WUI, for example, um, then we'd have more watersheds that were closer to communities that would have more of a WUI risk. Now, QRA didn't only consider threats to like communities, right? There's like timber industry land is a is a criteria, right? There's other Water resources, other, habitat, yeah, yeah lots yeah, of Yeah, infrastructure, those sorts of things. So cell towers. I mean, it might make sense. I just want to make sure everyone understands that like that is a prioritization that has values baked in. And one of those values is is wooey. Um, but it's not the only one. And I do I do and I know they're redoing this, um, but we don't this is not the new data, right? This is the old data. Correct. Right. This is the currently available data. Yeah. And in the new in the redo, they're not they're not changing their value criteria. I don't know the answer to that. They are. They're going through a process of defining new HVRAs and their response functions. Okay, just the last thing. It does not seem that that could be what we come up with for our priorities. And maybe we should think about if that can work for us or if we if we want something if we want to dial those knobs differently um for this exercise yeah I mean, this is another thing that we've been kind of wrestling with is um you know when will the qwra new data come out and when do have when do we need to have data to use to sort of produce a report by june um, and our thinking is that they're going to align poorly and we're going to miss that window where we can get the new data. Um, and so we've been talking, the way we've been approaching this is let's use the currently existing data for the first iteration, which we will then publish in June, recognizing that once the new stuff comes out, it'll get incorporated into that decision support tool and in future iterations of prioritization, um, uh, it will be incorporated. So this is sort of like the near-term phase one um, component, thinking that, assuming that there's going to be phases two through, you know, this problem may never end, so that we may never, so we may have like an infinite number of phases, right? because um, you're going to continually need to be maintaining it, if nothing else. So uh, hopefully we get to sort of resilience as we define it um, within 20 years or before, and then we're just in a maintenance mode after that. Um, that's how we're thinking about it. Is that, is that sort of a satisfactory response, Joseph? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Katie? Yeah, thanks, Dan. And actually sort of answered what I was going to ask. I was feeling foolish because I was like, why don't we use the QWRA update? And I say that um, highly biased because I've been convening a rangelands group of experts provide um, input on values in rangeland systems and how wildfire affects those values. And so um, one issue I have with this iteration, first off, love that you embrace the sagebrush conservation design. However, <laughs> that's just for sagebrush ecosystems, which is only um, southeastern Oregon, a little bit of central Oregon. 
um, you know, a little bit of Baker County, but there are other types of rangelands in Eastern Oregon that aren't that. And so we actually, like, they just get kind of grayed out in this. Um, and so as long as you promise <laughs> that down the road, we will have a way to consider those types of rangelands. And again, how um, risk is modeled for, for rangeland values um, that, that I won't won't give you too hard of a time, but that, that was <laughs> the one I wanted to pipe in on today. Thanks, so, Dan. so I'll turn the tables on you. And if you had that data for the other uh, non-SageCon areas, we would be interested. Um, and if not, then I think what we wanna do is kind of flag that in the report, like here are the gaps that we don't have data for that need to be incorporated in future iterations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let's work together, Dan. So I'm convening that group. Our first meeting is next week um, and it will be rangeland experts from you know all over Eastern Oregon um, and quite a lot of representation from the Northeast. And one of our big questions is what are data sources that you know Andy McAvoy could integrate into his modeling um because we obviously I'm in uh southeastern Oregon we have our you know cool cool things um but they don't apply everywhere um so how about I get back to you on that and yeah. and obviously we'll we'll bring Andy along with that because I'm, I'm not a fire modeler but um being creative about those data sources is what I'm really interested in so that we we get those accurate um capture of the effect of fire on those values. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate that. Hey, we got a, a question in the uh, in the room here, Amanda. Um, thanks, Nate. Uh, so uh, sort of go back to Pete's question earlier about, you know, we're in an awkward predicament, right? I mean, Ryan, you said that there are quote unquote people who want to see maps, but a strategy doesn't necessarily require us to have those created. So basically it sounds like we are getting put in the position of creating something that is not the best product because there are certain individuals that do not understand the timing of this. So we're actually going to be more or less wasting time and money, you know, the people's time and money by producing something that isn't as up to date as we could by waiting perhaps a few months. So is there a reason to bring in whoever those people are or have some sort of a, I don't want to say like a come to Jesus moment, but like is there an opportunity for us to help explain that kind of predicament that we're in so that we are producing something that is the best product for the people of Oregon? Um, I, I, I mean, I guess my immediate answer is that we're going to, like, this is going to be updated through time, and we're going to produce the best product, the best information that we have right now. And we're going to continue to update it as new information is available in perpetuity. Um, so I don't necessarily feel like we're producing a, like wasting a bunch of resources to produce a product that isn't going to be useful. This is one step in a process. Um, and we're having a good conversation about it right now. Um, and it's going to help us continue to perfect you know, where we go with this. Yeah, it just, it just seems silly. Like, we, we can produce a strategy, right? We can produce high-level goals and, and priorities and things like that. But if having a, a good map to have that spatially prioritized, you know, could be done to the best of our ability by waiting a small amount of time instead of using five-year-old data that we know is currently being updated, it just, it seems like we, sh we should do that. I just, I, I guess I'm, I'm just really, I guess I'm frustrated at the, the, you know, this idea that we can't do that. Or I guess, I, I don't know all the politics there, so I, you know, I just, I'm just having a hard time with that, I guess. No, I, I hear you. And, but remember, too, that a static map isn't, 
from my perspective, isn't the end goal anyway. You know, the end goal is, is something that's dynamic. Um, so, may, so maybe then in that case, it's you know, being really poignant on what those priorities are from this map and, and really be very clear in the strategy as it relates to that map product of, you know, that this is phase one and phase one only goes until X date or something like that. Because if we know that we're going to have better information to, um, to work from in the near future, then let's be really clear and honest about that, that the maps that we can create now are, are should it be used for an elongated period of time, I guess. I think all of this work comes with, uh, you know, as Dan has articulated, and, and I think I've been talking about this process, all of this work comes with a lot of recommendations uh, for future development. Mm -hmm. And we got to start somewhere, and we're starting here with this data that we've got. And that, that's kind of how I'm looking at it. And Nathan, I don't know if you have more you want to add there, but. Um, I mean, the only thing I would add that what we've been talking about is the short-term mapping products to get us a base foundation where we're starting, and then how do we integrate that into that longer-term decision support? We've talked a lot about that a lot, and that's recognized at the agency coordination group, the strategic leadership group, and this group, and continue that conversation, and how to constantly integrate those changes. And that goes into part of that conversation of where priorities are already out within agencies. There's work being done. How do we see over time starting to look at the strategy, starting to integrate those coordinated investments? I think that's the critical piece here. And then also recognizing that more information is coming, things are constantly being updated, is the, ch is the challenge. And then integrate a shared stewardship approach with multi-agencies that things are changing over time as well. So I think we definitely need to think about that, but also you got to start somewhere. you got to start with something to build the foundation or start building from. And I think that's what we're really trying to get to is where do we really start and then how do we start through that adaptive management loop going over time. It's, it's, what, it's what, what you said, but how, that's, that's the challenge that we're constantly wrestling with and understanding that there's going to be constant updates and changes and over time. So that's, that's the challenge we're presented with, but it's also, I think, part of the, the excitement and the opportunity that we all see here is working together to hopefully get there over time. And I'll just offer another thought is sort of echoing a little bit. Um, you know, agencies are all are, are continuously making decisions. Um, all of the priorities that have been made thus far around Joint Chiefs and everything else, um, CFLRP and everything else is sort of made based on existing data. Um, even if the sort of shared priority geographic areas that we come up with shift over time, it will be, I think it'll still be beneficial and it will be something that kind of guides agencies towards um, more concentrated efforts that sort of uh, combine resources as opposed to independent um, decisions that are uh, checkerboarded across the entire state and don't have that kind of um, one plus one equals three value kind of thing, which is what we're really trying to achieve. So I think it's, it's worth recognizing that decisions are being made all the time with the existing data. Um, and even if it's flawed, it's better than, and even if what we come up with is flawed, it's going to be better than nothing that course that, that sort of concentrates, I think. The, the other just kind of thought process I want to put in here also is we talk about limited resources need to prioritize, but I think it's also about how are we utilizing our uh, resources appropriately and how are we kind of leveraging those resources collectively to make sure that we can increase pace and scale. So it may not necessarily be about more resources of the same, but how are we looking at um, how we are utilizing those resources, how we are working collectively in the agencies and partners to make sure that we're bringing that all together. And that's, that's part of the strategy too, that over time um, we're hoping to be more efficient with those um, and, and having areas where we know that we have those shared priorities and those coordinated investments is, is a part of that. We have to understand that and see that shift over time. So I want to add that in there. I see Oriana's got a, a question and then I also, as always, just kind of a time check. We're hitting that four o'clock hour. So 
Um, Oriana, if you got some, please uh, love to hear it. Yeah, uh, real, real quick here. Um, I'm curious where where the mapping is here, or how the potential benefits of restoration are being weighed, um, uh, and and mitigation work are being weighed outside of just the risk piece. Because I I think it's worth noting that we're working on a 20 year strategic plan, not just a 20 year risk management plan. And I think it's especially important if these maps get made available to some of the communities that are impacted or in these higher risk areas to understand not only what is the prioritization as it relates to the potential harm that can be done and the potential harm that can be avoided, but also what is the opportunity to create jobs or economic benefit or some of the other benefits that can come from, from this work. So this is maybe a little bit more of a comment than a question, but just curious how that benefit is being weighed both in our process and then also if there's an opportunity to do mapping of like an implant analysis or some other way to, to just speak to where, where that benefit can come um, for, for communities so that we're not just talking about the risks and the negatives, but also the opportunities that can come from doing this work and, and creating economic benefit. I'll, I'll, I'll jump on this one. Um, I think that's really good. Um, part of that also, I think, comes into that uh, monitoring accountability piece of it that we haven't uh, dove, dove into yet that we hope to soon, but conversations with the Ecosystem work, Workforce Program that's currently doing some social economic monitoring for uh, pre-existing programs and how that integrates us to help through that constant adaptive management loop is a piece of it, right? And that's like high level, um, starting to dig a little bit deeper, but that, that also is wanting to identify these geographic areas, but then that's that connection and that engagement with the local groups. And how, how is that going? How do we monitor that? How do we understand that at local groups? And then how do we provide those resources to make sure that we're achieving that outcome that we desire in those areas? And once again, um, that's a process over 20 years, but we need to be thinking about that stuff, looking at it, understanding it, monitoring it, and that's where we looked at that adaptive management loop. How is that um, helping us integrate from what we know now and resources we need in the future to understand some of those aspects? And that's just a, a piece of it. So hopefully that helps answer some of the question, but um, we're also thinking about that once again at a very high level to try to understand a little bit more. I just one quick comment. Mm -hmm. So I know we're, we're getting to the end. This is Amanda in the room here. Um, there was a comment last week around um, around the jobs piece that this we could incorporate um, into this strategy the ability to keep ODF and protection associations fire staff on um, throughout the year by utilizing them to achieve some of this work. I know that there's been other comments um, around the, um, the uh, Conservation Corps, right, that was created in 762, but, um, but I just wanted to put a marker down that there was also a comment um, and some strategy within a protection meeting last week about um, how, can, how can we also think about maintaining that critical workforce mm -hmm. um, within the fire um, system. Um, to be able to do project work associated with this. Um, and, and I'm sure there's other workforces, and obviously I represent a huge portion of that too on the private side, um, that we can we can also speak to. But I just wanted to put that mm -hmm. um, in, onto your radar. Um, and it seemed like there was a lot of uh, support for, for that concept to be incorporated into this um, by other parts of the department. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and wrap us up at the... At the uh, end of the hour here um, appreciate that appreciate all the comments this is all really good information and once again like um, taking this information uh, we're integrating that into future conversations so we really appreciate everyone's time um, and, and and we're going to continue to to really drive and dig deep into some of this so um, outside conversations as always questions calls um, feel free to do that and we'll continue to drive into this um, next steps we kind of lined out um, uh, what we're looking at for the development of the strategy phase three. Once again, these presentations is going to go onto the web page, so I'd recommend looking at the presentations, uh, the decks that gives you a little bit more in-depth information. And then we have our next meeting uh, February 14th. Um, so a big day there. Hopefully we can all uh, give each other some... It's not Valentine's Day, right? Day. Oh, okay. <laughs> also the state's birthday. Okay, so big day there, and we'll pass around Valentine's Day cards on that one. Um, really looking forward to that. I had to double check, so um, that's a good notice uh, for all of us. We have a month um, for Valentine's Day. 
Um, but uh, anyways, I'm really looking forward to that. Hope to bring more products, continue this conversation, and get us to that June, and then and then keep driving. So with that, as always, really appreciate it. Very thankful for for y'all, the work that Dan's doing, INR. Megan over here is making a lot of this stuff work, the technical issues. So just really a shout out to everyone that's, that's really digging deep. So with that, have a wonderful evening. Um, we'll talk to you soon. And yep, thank you.